Good afternoon, colleagues. Let us get started because we all have uh, quite many, over 50 people joined uh, already online and uh, we have 150 people registered. So this is um, in the room, it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, OEN, so, uh, but for online colleagues, uh, just to um, uh, introduce myself, uh, this, uh, I'm Dege Chulumbatar, uh, Agriculture Research Officer at Office of Innovation and uh, co-lead for Akio Initiative. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to, that you join us uh, online and also in, in room. Uh, and um, so welcome to second seminar of uh, ATIO seminar series on agriculture, agri-food innovation systems. And uh, to kick us started, uh, Van Song will shortly make some uh, opening remarks, uh, remarks and then uh, followed by Fabrizio presenting a bit about ATIO, what ATIO is and uh, why we are here. And uh, then we have uh, Professor Lawrence Clark will uh, tell us uh, the state of art uh, research uh, and um, uh, on agriculture innovation systems and how it's been evolved and where we are heading to. So, um, so just to save time, uh, as I was saying, it's an on uh, the hybrid event. We have uh, about 150 people registered for the event and uh, and uh, so online colleagues, please do. Um, make a good use of a uh, chat and Q and A, put your specific questions in Q and A, but uh, please use the chat uh, box to networking and exchanging information and also leave us um, any inputs and resources that might be useful for this uh, topic and ATIO in general. So um, uh, with uh, that, uh, I'll hand it over to Vincent Martin, our Director of Office of Innovation to, for his inspiring words. Inspiring words? Inspiring words. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> no, thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Deggy. And thank you to uh, Fabrizio and, uh, and Deggy and the team behind you to organize this uh, at your series. Uh, as you said, it's a second uh, webinar. Uh, we are having on this uh, topic. Um, I, I will I will share with you a few words on, on what is ATIO, and I think my remarks are more directed to the people who are online, which I don't know who is online actually, but because in the room here we've got most of our uh, office which is represented, and I think they all know ATIO by heart. They don't. <laughs> that is bad. But um, uh, if you if you don't anyway, you will have a presentation also from Fabrizio Fabrizio and uh, ATIO. Um, so I will just give you some uh, a few uh, highlights. So as you know, the uh, Agri-Food System Technology and Innovation Outlook, uh, it's a key initiative from of the uh, Science and uh, Innovation Strategy of, uh, of FAO, uh, which aims to close this science, technology, and innovation gap. Um, it is not the only innovation, uh, sorry, not the only initiative that will contribute to close this science, technology, innovation gap. There will be many others, but this, was, this one is an important one. And the idea be, be, uh, behind closing the STI gap is uh, making science, technology, innovation uh, affordable, accessible, and inclusive. That's really the uh, three, I would say, keywords to say, how do we want to close the STI gap and what it is to close the STI gap? It's really about affordability, accessibility, and uh, inclusivity. And to do so, you need to know, so affordability, accessibility, and uh, inclusivity, you also need the right knowledge. You need to know what exists out there, what kind of technologies and innovation can be used today to contribute to agri-food system transformation, but also the ones that are coming uh, in the future, that are just nascent, that are pre-emerging and emerging. What are they? What are these technologies and innovation? And uh, how can we get prepared for the future by already anticipating the use of these new technologies and innovation? So that will be the objective of this uh, ATIO, uh, that we, because it would be two things. It would be a forward-looking biennial report. So every two years, we'll have a report, the ATIO report, that will look at the, uh, what is currently available and what is coming in the future. So using foresight and horizon scanning. And the other part of the other component of ATIO is this uh, ATIO knowledge base. Uh, so it's not just about a narrative explaining 
what we have today and what is coming up in a big way, but it's also uh, updating constantly this information into a database, which would be the at your uh, knowledge base, which will fill the gap in terms of uh, providing evidence on agri-food system STIs. And the objective of all that is to facilitate informed decision making and investment planning. How do we influence this investment in research and innovation? Again, by having this data and this information, it's, it's key. The report, so the first part of the ATU is the report. It will be published in 2025 in October. So we'll have uh, at the next Science and Innovation Forum, we can already anticipate that we'll, be, uh, we'll have a big launching of the uh, first ATU report. And I think Fabrizio will probably come back on what will be the content of this report. Uh, the database, um, it's a kind of ongoing process. It will take a little bit more time to, to, uh, to build it, but, uh, but we, are, we are already building the, uh, I mean, the elements of this knowledge base, and there are already information scattered uh, in different databases uh, on STI, but we want to bring them all together so that we will have this information on the agri-food system transformation STIs in one place. So in a nutshell, ATIO uh, intends to provide evidence-informed analysis to inform the debates in a constructive and inclusive uh, manner. A few more things I wanted to share with you, but you are, I think uh, here in the room, you already know it, but it's, uh, ATIO is, embraces a diversity of agri-food innovation. It's not only technological innovation. So it's also social, political, and organizational uh, innovation. So that's an important point because in most of the database I was mentioning and most of the places where you can find this information, you will very often find frontier techs or technological innovation and very little information on policy innovation, institutional innovation, grassroots innovations. So uh, our objective is quite ambitious because we want to bring this type of uh, innovations uh, to the knowledge of our uh, partners and, uh, and stake, uh, stakeholders. Uh, one, one more thing I, I wanted to mention is that um, the ATU initiative in, uh, and the upcoming report, it recognizes also that there are alternative visions or paradigms regarding research and innovation. And they play a very important role in shaping investment decisions today. Um, and you will find much more information on these uh, uh, research and innovation paradigms in our foresight report that we've just published during the Science and Innovation Forum. Uh, and part of this information will be integrated, if I'm not wrong, into the first uh, at your report. And I can say, uh, I, I've been reading it very carefully. It's, it's not an, an easy reading, this uh, REAPS, this uh, research and innovation paradigm shifts and the, uh, and the uh, uh, transformation that are needed. But this concept of innovation paradigms, I think I just wanted to mention it because uh, uh, it's important to realize that it has evolved significantly in recent decades. It has shifted from a descriptive focus on historical transformation to a normative focus on how innovation should be conducted. And how innovation should be conducted is uh, you know, this concept of open innovation, of uh, sustainable innovation and so on and so forth. So we move from this very uh, historical transformation, how do we uh, make this progress happen, something very tangible, very uh, obvious as, a, as an innovation, to how should we do innovation. Uh, so that's a, a paradigm shift. But, and uh, the experts in the room could uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that uh, this, even these this, uh, this paradigm shifts, uh, by using them, and the, the one that we had uh, until now, there is a risk uh, that we limit by using these paradigm shifts today, innovation and research paradigm shifts, there is a, li a risk to limit the breakthrough potential by confining innovation within established frameworks. It's a bit conceptual, but, but the idea is to say, uh, and, and we, we, we have it in our recent foresight report, uh, so we, co we study the context of research and innovation in pre-emerging and emerging paradigm shifts using a more holistic and anticipatory approach, acknowledging that transformative change can arise from various sources, including grassroots movements and local knowledge. This is what I wanted to come up with. It's a, a very uh, complex uh, body of uh, knowledge and, uh, and, uh, and, and research. But at the end of the day, by challenging this 
previous paradigm shifts, we came up with the idea that uh, uh, we have to be more holistic and anticipatory in the way we envisage research and innovation. And this is how we came up with the idea that uh, uh, grassroots movements, local knowledge are extremely important in this, uh, uh, in, uh, in the sense technology innovation while promoting for agri-food system transformation. I won't go any, any further on, on this aspect, but I think it was, it's interesting to, uh, to mention it. And another one which is extremely important and very much related to uh, today's, uh, uh, today's meeting is the fact that uh, uh, emerging challenges and trends affecting the inclusivity and sustainability of agri-food systems indicate the, the need to rethink the concept of agri-food innovation systems. So we came up with the idea that we need to rethink the concept of agri-food innovation system, which has guided so much of our strategic thinking on the generation and scaling of technologies and innovation up to now. And we need to take a more mission-oriented perspective, which is the, uh, the object of, uh, of today's, uh, today's discussion. So with the emergence of the private sector as a leader of investment in technologies and innovation, and the simultaneous call for deepening the democratization of STI processes, both aspects are covered by ITO, it has become crucial to identify approaches that policymakers can adopt to ensure that all key actors in innovation systems can be synergized toward achieving sustainable and equitable agri-food systems. Again, it, it looks very theoretical the way I'm saying it, but basically, so we will hear, hear from the experts on mission-oriented innovation, and this is uh, the object of discussion we're having today uh, while we are developing uh, a, a program called Mainstream, uh, in which we will integrate this notion of mission-oriented uh, uh, innovation uh, systems. So this, uh, this discussion under the ATIO uh, series specifically on mission-oriented innovation is extremely timely because it's going to help us to develop a program that we will start implementing next year in 2025. So um, I think I've already uh, talked too much, but that was uh, a few ideas and concepts I wanted to share with you, which I think are, are really uh, fascinating. And uh, now we'll get into the, uh, the substance and more details with uh, Fabrizio and, uh, and the experts. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Vincent, for that um, uh, inspiring words and also conceptual insights on uh, uh, innovation system and the mission-oriented innovation system. Now, Fabrizio uh, will uh, enlighten us further on Atio, and uh, Fabrizio is a uh, especially for those online. It's kind of weird talking to your own colleagues in the room, but uh, <laughs> to be mindful, there are 60 people online. Uh, that Fabrizio is a senior technical officer, uh, the lead of uh, ATIO initiative uh, in the OEM. So Fabrizio, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Deggy. So I, I will just uh, steal a few uh, minutes uh, just to give a little bit of an overview about uh, the, ST, uh, the ATIO initiative. Um, so that uh, you can better contextualize uh, the uh, presentation that we will have uh, in, a, in a few uh, few minutes. Um, and actually, I would also like to uh, remark that you know, the idea of having uh, seminars where we will where we are presenting the uh, the, the work that is being done for the uh, under the ATIO initiative, in particular for the ATIO publication, is a decision really to. Um, uh, it's really about giving sort of a transparency also to the uh, to the whole work that is going on, so that uh, when the report uh, comes, although some uh, elements of the report will be known, uh, but at least you know it helps uh, building up the uh, the uh, the understanding of the report itself uh, and make it a little bit more uh, accessible uh, when uh, the moment will uh, will come. So um, let me just. Uh, uh, run through the uh, this uh, some of the concepts that are underpinning the ATIO uh, initiative. So, as Vincent mentioned, uh, the uh, the whole uh, uh, effort really arises from the concern that there is out there a science, technology, and innovation uh, gap, you know, and that this uh, justifies 
uh, the investment in the ATIO initiative. What are the dimensions or some of the dimensions of this uh, science and technology and innovation gap? Uh, one is the fact that in, you know, in spite of the fact that we, there is a lot of uh, uh, technology that is becoming available, that we know that will become available over the next uh, uh, 10, 20 years, uh, there is uh, still a, a sense that uh, the, um, uh, there is an untapped potential out there uh, that needs to be uh, uh, unleashed in order to, in order to uh, promote uh, uh, global food uh, security. Um, second is that, uh, uh, and this is an important part of the gap, uh, that there is uh, an uneven uh, access to uh, uh, technology and innovations and their use uh, across uh, the world, particularly you know, if you're looking at the development uh, uh, divide, right, in between low and middle income countries on one side and um, uh, upper middle and industrialized countries on, on the other. Um, the, uh, there is also a sense uh, related to this gap that uh, no, the, uh, the investments that are going into um, uh, research, development and innovation are uh, not properly uh, targeted and allocated. There is a, this is partly driven by the fact that uh, there is a, a lack of uh, systematic evidence about uh, investments in uh, research, development and innovation and uh, in terms of uh, you know where these um, uh, and where technologies are actually being uh, uh, deployed and used and so forth. Um, fourthly, uh, there is a, a gap in terms of the uh, coordination between public and private uh, in uh, investors. Uh, partnerships between public and private uh, investors in uh, research, development, innovation is of course uh, uh, key. Uh, but again, this is uh, hampered uh, oftentimes by asymmetries in terms of information about uh, you know, the uh, technologies and innovations and, uh, and where the investments are being uh, undertaken in this uh, particular uh, area. Uh, private sector's contribution, we, we, we know that there is, uh, no, but the data have uh, until recently been telling us that there is a lot of investment going in, in uh, food techs and uh, act techs. Uh, so that the private sector is very much alive in terms of investing uh, and actually has become sort of the, dri the dominant driver in terms of investments in uh, uh, research development of innovation. But recent data is actually telling us that there, is a, there has been a, a huge uh, decline recently in terms of uh, you know, investments uh, in the ag tech and food tech uh, sector. And there is a lot of uncertainty about where this will go in the, in the near uh, future. So we hope that you know, the, uh, that, uh, the ATIO initiative in this sense can uh, also help providing a little bit of a better understanding of where this specific uh, area uh, or uh, segment of the uh, uh, of investors is actually uh, going towards to and and finally the uh, no there is a uh, there is a uh, the, there is also a, a need to better understand how uh, what are sort of the key drivers be, behind the, this uh, the science technology innovation uh, uh, gap to better understand them and to see how they're actually going to be influencing the development of, of innovation uh, systems, which is actually quite key in order to shape uh, investment decisions in uh, research development and innovation. Um, so going to ATIO, uh, basically the uh, ATIO has, uh, it, it's, it's basically uh, has two components, let's say. So one is the biennial publication Vincent was uh, referring to, and the other one is the uh, knowledge base to which also Vincent was, <laughs> has been uh, referring. Um, so the, the idea is that you know, the, the knowledge base uh, is um, uh, going to be uh, you know, uh, providing uh, um, and actually, I will mention this a little bit more detail in the next slides. Um, we'll be able to actually federate the different uh, uh, sources of information about uh, research and development and innovation in the agri food sector um, and, uh, and feed this information through the science, technology, innovation portal, which is uh, under uh, development. Uh, the publication itself is really about providing uh, data analysis uh, uh, from a global uh, perspective on uh, science, technology, and innovation and related investments. And is also uh, the ATO initiative is also an opportunity also to uh, further uh, leverage the uh, cap capability that uh, FAO is developing in terms of uh, you know, uh, foresight and horizon scanning uh, 
um, uh, analysis, or in particular in relation to the science, technology, and innovation, and better understand the trends and patterns in investments in research, development, and innovation. The distinctive approaches of uh, ATIO, one is the global coverage, as I mentioned uh, before, but with a particular focus on low and middle income uh, countries. Uh, Secondly, this is uh, again um, in relation to what Vincent was mentioning before, the idea to go beyond the specific technology focus and broaden the focus uh, uh, in terms of uh, institutional, social and policy innovations. Uh, and then thirdly, is not only about agriculture, but it's about agri-food sector, so going beyond the, the farm gate and primary uh, production. Uh, in the report, what are we going to be looking at? So one is a better understanding of the uh, uh, global trends and outlook on science, technology, and innovation and uh, related uh, investments. Uh, second, uh, trying to better understand the, uh, the, the entry point for policymakers when uh, thinking about uh, uh, innovation uh, systems. And here, the, uh, the, uh, this uh, reference to the uh, uh, mission-oriented policy innovation approaches. Uh, and this is going to be the, the, the subject of uh, Lauren's presentation. Uh, a better understanding of how democratization of STI processes can uh, uh, happen. Uh, this is uh, a topic uh, that has been uh, has a long tradition, let's say. And so in the, in the report, we are trying to understand what is new really about uh, uh, democratization of STI processes, which kind of innovations and new ideas can we bring uh, in that specific uh, um, uh, domain. Uh, finally, there is also an aspect related to the efficiency of investments in uh, research, development, and innovation. The time lag uh, that uh, goes from uh, investments to impact uh, is uh, uh, significant. We are talking about uh, decades, many uh, often times. And so the question is whether or no there are policy and institutional uh, strategies that one could follow in order to shorten uh, that, uh, that lag. And then finally, uh, ideas on how to stimulate partnerships uh, among this wide variety of stakeholders. Uh, through time, uh, as we mentioned before, the private sector has been emerging as a sort of a leading uh, uh, investor in uh, research development and innovation. Uh, but there are many other actors at the grassroots uh, level, as was mentioned by Vincent uh, uh, before, in addition to the formal subsystem uh, in, the, you know, in, in, the, in the broader agri-food innovation system. So the question about what kind of uh, approaches can we take in order to better shape the partnerships between these uh, different stakeholders. So I will not spend too much time here on the knowledge uh, base, just to mention that uh, uh, one important approach of this uh, knowledge base is the, is, the, is the idea of federating existing uh, uh, sources of data that uh, in a way from the point of view of the user uh, of this information is a little bit scattered uh, all, all over the place, but to bring them uh, into a uh, more structured uh, um, uh, interface uh, that can be queried and um, and um, and accessed on a more uh, no by, by by allowing users of this information to actually use the information to respond to their some of their specific uh, concerns. Um, it has two uh, pillars. Uh, one is a say a, a knowledge base that will be. Um, uh, developed uh, by using AI tools, so uh, scraping and harvesting information from, uh, from uh, the web. Uh, but no, that kind of approach, however uh, important it is in terms of getting to the, to the broader scope of uh, the information that is available out there on uh, technologies and innovation, leaves aside uh, the, uh, all, the, uh, all, the, uh, all those uh, technologies and innovations that are uh, happening at the grassroots level. And so a second pillar of the knowledge base uh, intends basically to use crowdsourcing as a way to bring uh, that information from the grassroots into the knowledge uh, base. And this will require substantial collaboration with uh, organizations that represent farmers and indigenous people. So you know, the governance around uh, this uh, knowledge base will be actually a very interesting aspect of, the, of its uh, development. 
And finally, to close, uh, where are the opportunities that the ATIO initiative opens? Uh, of course, knowledge sharing and dissemination will be uh, one. Uh, no, we would like to use the ATIO initiative uh, not only um, just to produce a knowledge base and a report, but is also about uh, uh, triggering collaboration and partnerships uh, with uh, key uh, stakeholders uh, at global and regional and local level. Uh, bringing new ideas in terms of how to accelerate the generation adoption in, uh, of technology and innovations, this uh, gap I was referring to uh, before. And then, uh, uh, yeah, give insights to policymakers, uh, some guidance or uh, some, some light in terms of how innovation ecosystems uh, can be actually uh, leveraged uh, through uh, you know, uh, appropriate uh, policies and uh, institutional uh, reforms. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Fabrizio, for this um, very uh, good and thorough uh, introduction of uh, ACU report, uh, not ACU report, ACU initiative. Now um, I uh, give floor to Professor Lawrence Clerk. He's a full professor of agriculture innovation and transition at the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Talca in Chile. But prior to that, he was a uh, or is still affiliated with, uh, with the Knowledge, Technology, and Innovation Group of University of Wageningen. And he's a renowned expert, as many of us know in this room, uh, in the field of agriculture innovation studies. And his research and teaching focuses on, on various topics related to agri-food innovation system dynamics, institutional change, innovation policies, and co-innovation approaches, and among others. Lawrence has um, experience uh, carrying out the research and uh, being involved in various countries, not only uh, Europe, but also Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And uh, he published over 180 articles in international peer-reviewed journals. And um, yeah, and we are very happy to have Lawrence here in person instead on uh, screen <laughs> and uh, very pleased to have you Lawrence and uh, please uh, go ahead and enlighten us. I will. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you so much for having me in person. I'm also very happy to be here. It's much more fun to uh, present in front of an audience instead of uh, sitting uh, at the computer only. You can also better see the reactions of people, whether they're bored, uh, whether they're kind of enthusiastic about what you're talking about. So that's also good. So um, a big title, Evolving Agri-Food Innovation Systems to Support Agri-Food Systems Transformation. Um, I'll tell all about that in the next 30 minutes. Luckily, uh, Deji has her phone here, so I can look where I'm still within time. So um, to start off, a bit of introduction. For most of you, this will not be a new thing. Uh, you, most of us will have heard about this debate on planetary boundaries, uh, that uh, we are exceeding our safe operating space uh, in several um, aspects, uh, climate change, uh, biosphere integrity, biodiversity, freshwater use, ocean acidification, um, agriculture is not the only cause of problems, but is uh, indeed a huge factor in this uh, exceeding of the planetary boundaries. Uh, so if you look at the picture, the green space is what is, is the safe operating space. Um, the red is danger, bad, and yeah, uh, the dots are where, where agriculture contributes. Well, agriculture is, is already contributing to several uh, elements. and. Sadly, this is also because of the innovations of the past. Uh, so uh, breeding uh, of uh, uh, highly productive crops has led to the reduction uh, of uh, diversity in germplasm, which we use. Um, if you look at fertilizers, uh, which have uh, boosted yields, uh, they are also responsible for 
uh, exceeding phosphorus and nitrogen in many places of the world, polluting water, soils, etc. So I think the task nowadays is that we continue to innovate, but that we do it in a responsible way and try to not do it in a way which will cause problems in 50 years. Yeah, that's, of course, always difficult because innovation is about breaking stuff. And if you're too cautious, you won't change anything. But this is the balance we need to take into account. And if you look at uh, the rights, uh, the table basically says, you know, we can't continue uh, business as usual because the pressure on the planetary limits will only grow if we continue in a business as usual way. So many people have recognized this, amongst uh, whom is FAO. Uh, they have done this really nice report, Harvesting Change, but they're not the only ones. Uh, also World Bank, all kinds of governments, NGOs, they have published lots of reports uh, um, basically stating uh, we are in a state of emergency, we need to uh, change our food systems, our agri-food systems um, that can be in different ways, agri in an agro-ecological agro ways, in a digital way. Uh, we can just look at the agri part of the food system, we can also do an overall food strategy just like the UK. Um, there's many reports, um, but What's written in reports also needs to be brought into practice eh? because paper is patient, as we have a saying in Dutch and perhaps also uh, in other uh, languages. So what we need to do or what is already happening is we need to engage in a plurality of transformation pathways. So basically um, what perhaps was one of the mistakes of the Green Revolution is that we envisioned one future for the planet. Eh? Um, we said, this is the way to go. We should modernize agriculture with all these great new technologies. Um, well, one, as I already said, that's, that's, that has led to uh, uh, bad consequences in the longer term, but also it has excluded all kinds of ways of producing, uh, ways of um, consuming also foods uh, uh, which have been pushed out uh, by this focus on yeah, modernized agriculture. So already uh, in the last decades, we saw kind of counter movements, uh, protesting against uh, uh, green revolution technologies. And don't get me wrong, I don't say it has been all bad because it was logic and necessary at the time. Uh, but uh, like I said, it has yielded uh, undesirable consequences. And that's why people already have started working on uh, different new paradigms, uh, new um, yeah, ways of doing agriculture, um, also seeing agriculture in this broader picture of agri-food systems. It's not just only about the production end, but also how we process it, how we transport it, how we consume it, what we do with food waste, etc. So you see nowadays, and this is just a couple of concepts, a lot of uh, concepts going around. Sustainable intensification, ecological intensification, agriculture 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. I don't know in which one we are at the moment. I, I still stick to 4.0, but I reckon I already need to move to 5.0. Uh, circular agriculture, vertical agriculture, regenerative agriculture, nature inclusive agriculture, nature positive agriculture, etc., etc., etc. So there's lots of stuff going on. Um, and this has already started over the last decade, but it's now becoming more, more visible. And there's more debate about, yeah, which one of these uh, should we go for? Or perhaps we should have several coexisting paradigms. So uh, the Netherlands, for example, has really put their bets on circular food systems and, and also circular bioeconomy. Uh, the Netherlands is a small country, but with fairly uh, huge production. Huh? Also, we import a lot and we re-export it again. It's not all produced in the Netherlands. But uh, the footprint of agriculture is way too big for the country. So the current policy paradigm is about, OK, we need to start reducing and we need to make sure that we can produce it with what we have and that we make better use of all the nutrients in the system, keep them in, keep them in and, and circulate them. Uh, from animal production to plant production to industries, make use of the of the materials uh, which are seen as waste to reuse them, make use of energy in one place and shift it to another place. That is the current paradigm. There's also uh, another uh, uh, very 
yeah, a strong movement, which comes more from the grassroots. Yeah, I very much agree that innovation can come from all kinds of places. Well, this is what they typically say has surged as a grassroots movement is agroecology, in which you have high diversity. You also have uh, an idea of agriculture is something you do in community. It's not necessarily for a market. So uh, it's, it's not necessarily something you should export food, but you should uh, produce it locally. Um, it has a whole set of values, principles behind it. Uh, well, this is also one of these potential uh, transformative pathways. Um, some people have seen it as kind of the opposite to another uh, uh, stream, which is kind of digital agriculture, or agriculture 4.0. And there's lots of reports which say agroecology is kind of the angel uh, amongst the transformation pathways and uh, digital agriculture is the demon amongst uh, uh, transformation pathways. Uh, and some people has, have also put that in kind of utopian and dystopian pictures. But there's also people say, now we can also, also marry it and we can have a new field of digital agroecology, also perhaps to solve some problems with agroecology, which, for example, are the high need for labor. Uh, and how do you get all those people who are now living in cities and will start to live in cities back to the countryside with their plow and their hoe to work the land? Huh? So. There's also people who take in this uh, fairly pragmatic view and can also transcend some of those value clashes. Another one which is also quite uh, in vogue nowadays, and you see it up, going up and down in terms of uh, whether it is a yeah, commercial success or no. Uh, a couple of years ago, we talked a lot about, about, about plant-based meat, plant-based burgers, but a lot of these companies now struggle a lot uh, to keep their product on the market. But there's also other ways of producing alternative proteins. Uh, cellular uh, meat production um, is, is, is one uh, opportunity in which uh, it is also going beyond kind of the lab phase and already having some commercial products on the market. Uh, it can also be about uh, insects as, as uh, inputs to proteins algae, uh, but also going back to legumes, pulses, promote these much more, uh, in a sense, go back to perhaps earlier diets, which were much more rich in these sorts of proteins instead of uh, meat-based proteins, animal-based uh, proteins. So uh, this is just an illustration of some of these pathways. And yeah, uh, policy frameworks, and uh, not just uh, think tank and geo reports, but also policy frameworks are already contemplating this. Uh, so some up more for the digital, some up more for circular, some up more for agroecology, uh, some opt for uh, a combination of those. Uh, so there's lots of stuff going on in, in various countries around the world. Um, and I think this goes for both high income countries, but also for LIMC, uh, where there's also thinking uh, in the right shop we had for the uh, ATEO uh, chapter, which this presentation is linked to. We also had a colleague who was already looking at how in Africa some countries are also moving beyond the productivity paradigm, which of course is very important because you need to feed the mouth to also including some of these broader uh, uh, food systems transformation elements, such as environmental values, inclusion, etc. So it's happening basically all over the planet. And it's also important to consider that, uh, and this is a quite illegible picture, uh, I would expect to, for FAO to have huge screens where you can see every detail. Um, but basically, yeah, every transformation pathway or every new every food system has pros and cons, has trade-offs. So you can score them on, on different domains. Uh, are they just ethical, equitable food systems in terms of access? As some people say, yeah, very nice cellular egg and alternative protein, but that will be far too expensive for the masses. Where others say, no, this will go down to such a low price, it will be accessible to the masses. Some then will say, but what about all those animal production uh, uh, based systems and the culture is attached to that, you know, what will that mean? Will culture disappear? Uh, uh, or what do these farmers need to do? Well, those are the sorts of considerations you need to consider in your innovation process. But also, does it provide healthy, adequate and safe diets uh, for all 
um, does it contribute to a clean and healthy planet? And also, does it produce economically thriving, robust food value chains, or perhaps no chains, if you also want to opt for local, huh? that you're not a global chain, but just a very local community-driven system. So there's all kinds of considerations, and perhaps it is very important uh, very difficult to find one ideal system which meets all criteria, but at least you can uh, do these types of exercise to see, you know, what yeah is best fit, what is optimal given circumstances. And what is also very important to consider in this discussion, and I don't see it that much, but from the field of transition studies and transformation studies, I think Saar also referred a little bit uh, to the concepts behind it. There's increasing yeah, thinking and even criticism that says, yeah, how can you do agri-food systems transformation or transformation with an eternal growth-oriented paradigm, huh? uh, with a paradigm which concentrates wealth? Huh? And then mainly the people critical about this are talking about the neoliberal academic paradigm. So there's now lots of discussion about what could be alternative economic models. And... Uh, some of you might already know uh, the, the, the donut economy model from Kate Rayworth, uh, which works with the planetary boundaries. So it's about, okay, it can, an economy, nice, it needs to be thriving, but you need to have some parameters to, to, yeah, to make it a, a, a system which is um, robust for the long term, which doesn't deplete the planet. Um, there's this whole uh, school of thought and practice around degrowth, ungrowth, post-growth, and also some reflection already on what does this mean for agri-food systems. There's people that basically take uh, perhaps the Bhutan perspective on life, uh, the, instead of GDP, the general happiness uh, uh, indicator, uh, well-being economics. Um, and then, of course, and this, this also underpins a little bit this, uh, this, this presentation, there's this, this thinking on a mission economy. How can you gear the economy towards more public uh, goals instead of merely having a laissez-faire uh, approach in which you repair the damage, uh, the market failures, but you do not think proactively what is good for us. So this is something which is also important to consider. But this is also maybe one of the hardest things uh, to change yeah? because it's, it's, it's rooted quite heavily in what we do, how we have organized everything, our politics, the vested interests, etc. And uh, yeah, each agri-food system transformation pathway and also the economic system behind it has implications for land use. Uh, so um, it brings about new telecoplings and telecoplings are things that you do in one side of the planet has implications for other places. So if we say, um, oh, let's reject all that cellular meat, let's reject all that laboratory high processed uh, alternative meat, let's go back to the source and eat good beef from South America. Well, if we do that here in Europe, you could see perhaps, uh, despite ESG and new rules, more deforestation over there. So each system, uh, and I see Paul frowning, this will not make the book <laughs> telecoupling. <laughs> uh, each system ha has implications for developments elsewhere. Uh, um, also, yeah, it, it leads to a redivision of urban and rural. Uh, where do we produce food? Uh, it might also move more towards cities with vertical farming, for example, uh, or other high-tech forms of farming. And that might also uh, give space for rewilding and renaturing rural space. Uh, it is also the land sparing caring debate. I don't know whether I used the, the right terms. Um, now also uh, with, with digital coming in, you also have all kinds of feedback loops uh, between the digital, the social and the ecological. Uh, so now we order food with a click. Um, we have AI uh, also getting into our machines, which we use to produce food. Um, you know, how we order food, the social element can have a cyber effect. Eh? It can start calculations in many data centers that has an ec ecological footprint because they use a lot of energy. They might suck up water, which can otherwise be used for uh, agriculture. So you see all kinds of new couplings emerge eh, with these new models. And uh, yeah, it also comes uh, with, with new uh, political economies, uh, the, these kinds of changes. Uh, who's in control, who's no longer in control. Uh, 
it's also about does change really happen or not. So it's very important in this uh, debate on, on, on food systems transformation uh, um, because there's so much power structures involved and things you also need to get rid of, not just to phase on, to focus on innovation, but also on what you could call x novation. And this is the X curve of transformation. It's a little bit based on the multi-level level perspective. Some of you might know it. But basically it's about, you know, change started starts in, in, in spots, uh, in experimental spots. Those can be companies, that can be grassroots movement, it can be science. At some point it moves up the, the TRL, the TRL ladder had a technology readiness level, but also the societal readiness level, the system readiness level, and it emerges. And at some point it institutionalizes and stabilizes, and then you have sort of a new food system. Huh? So at some point, perhaps uh, these alternative proteins will become a new viable uh, food system, perhaps replacing animal-based foods, perhaps alongside them. But for that, you also need to get rid of some stuff. You, you might need to change diets that people say, yes, we're gonna balance our diets, less meat-based, more plant-based protein. Um, it can also be about, uh, if you talk about vertical farming that you say, yes, we're gonna promote this and we're gonna uh, disincentivize uh, greenhouses because they take up too much land space just to say something. So uh, for, for many um, innovations to emerge, you also should make the the current alternative less attractive. You see it, for example, a lot in the energy sector where they nowadays do not only promote new forms of energy, but also put really clear dots on the horizon. We're gonna phase out diesel engines by 2040. In Chile recently where I live, the carbon plants for energy production were basically closed. Lots of protests, no, we can't do that yet. Government said, no, we're gonna close because we have the alternative and we need to foster that more. We, we don't need this competition anymore between the old economy and kind of the new energy economy. So it's also important to consider that you also need exnovation. Basically, uh, no, basically is not the right word. Well, I can say basically, basically I've now discussed, you know, what is transformation about, but now I'll move uh, to uh, how to do it, uh, how to organize for it. And this is, this agri-food innovation systems perspective. Uh, it has been around now in the current form for about 20 years. It was introduced about uh, yeah, 2006, 2004, five, six. Uh, basically it is about, you know, uh, for innovation, you need to look at the interactions between all players in an agri-food system. They all matter at some point. Uh, it goes beyond uh, previous thinking, which saw innovation more with research extension. Uh, basically, yeah, it, it, it broadened our view on innovation to a view which is about networks, uh, which co-create innovation. Um, precisely because you need these bundles of innovation. Uh, it's not just about pushing a technology, but you also need organizational change. You need institutional change. You need regulatory, regulatory change. And that means that at some point you need to, you know, get those people on board, preferably proactively. Uh, otherwise you might also delay your innovation uh, in, a, in a big way, or you might get outright failure. Um, and I've put this, in this thing with AAS 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And basically the point I want to make here is that I think AAS have always existed in practice. I think also back in the day we had multiple interactions only we didn't contemplate it at least from like an analytical perspective that way we also gave sort of the, 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 the how can you say that, um, we saw as the driving force for innovation many times, uh, research and technology. It basically was created by some geniuses and then pushed to practice. Uh, so in practice, obviously there were more interactions. Uh, scientists also went to the field, talked to people. Uh, uh, also there were probably uh, uh, interactions with companies, etc. but still it had this idea of it comes from science and you need to push it out. So that's at AAS 1.0. This was broadened when we looked at more interactive science, uh, more interactions, particularly with farmers. That was this knowledge and information system perspective, ACIS, uh, uh, not the ACIS as the EU use it nowadays, but the old school ACIS where the I stands for information. 
Then we moved like about 20 years ago to AIS, AIS 3.0, which was really seeing the innovation system as a complex adaptive system, multiple interactions. There's no single actor steering it. Um, it it's, it's, yeah, it adapts over time also to external uh, developments, etc. That is really like the AIS as, as we used to know it so far. And then the point is, is this still kind of fit for purpose or do we need to move to the fourth generation, uh, which is much more about being aware of, you know, what do we do innovation for? Uh, so where do we want to go? This idea of directionality. How can we also avoid that we go for a single model, but have a couple of parallel pathways, which can also accommodate for the diversity in lifestyles uh, and resource endowments, et cetera, context, cultural context, environmental context. Also being much more aware of, you know, how are the, the, the benefits and the risks distributed, uh, who gains, who loses, and also ideally trying to organize it in a democratic way, uh, in a participatory way. So basically, uh, the reason for having a new paradigm is more this transformation outlook, and that it can not be one single pathway, but multiple. Uh, also, I think what is needed is to, to broaden the boundaries of kind of the concept. It's not just the agricultural sector, but all these emerging technologies, these new concepts that have links with other sectors, for example, with energy, uh, agrovoltaic, circular systems, with the urban environment. This is also something different. It's not just something happening in rural areas. It happens all over the planet with multiple sectors. Um, yeah, and, and I will now explain a little bit more about, you know, what does this then look like, yeah, such a mission-oriented AIS? So basically, um, this is another yeah, definition of, a, of an AIS, we, which takes more kind of the, the challenge as kind of the leading feature for, for uh, knowing who's in it, uh, what sorts of interactions should you have, who should you invite uh, to complete a certain uh, societal mission, uh, protein transition, agriculture 4.0, agroecology. So it's not so much that you look at the AES at the level of the country, at the level of the sector, dairy, horticulture, at the level of the region, uh, uh, Puglia in Italy, uh, uh, Baden-Württemberg in Germany, just to mention some regions, uh, the Rift Valley in Kenya, I don't know whether that's a region, but um, so it's really taking the challenge kind of as the main organizing principle, uh, the, the transition pathway. So some of these examples of a mission-oriented AIS could be like this protein transition, uh, you have a protein transition AIS, urban farming, circular bioeconomy, digital ag. Uh, so uh, it's basically the system as it configures around a particular pathway, and that might include agricultural actors, uh, the traditional ones, but it might also include many new actors. And um, you see already, if you scan a little bit, and, and perhaps that's also something which Atio will do uh, in the future uh, when kind of the dashboard slash, what was the name you gave to it? Knowledge, Knowledge base is ready. Uh, um, you can you can see already different, more explicit food systems transformation missions, uh, like this circular agriculture as they have in the Netherlands. It's very much stated. But, you know, you also see transitions like agroecology happening in places without it being picked up formally. It's just there. It happens. Eh? And it is a mission of certain actors. And um, this mission-oriented thinking, it comes very much from Matsukato, uh, basically saying we need to revive the role of the state, have a strong state in pushing innovation. And she refers to the moonshot eh, that in the, what is it, the 50s, 60s, the US wanted to put the man on the moon and the Soviet Union as well. Um, that was strongly driving the interactions, a clear goal. Yeah, of course, we live in a different world now. I, I, I won't see any state doing that. Well, perhaps, you know, with the new kind of isol, you know, how you call that in isolationist practices. Yeah. We will see it again, but but nowadays it's also yeah perhaps NGOs pushing it, companies pushing it, but it's about having this this strong mission and and there is movements pushing it. So this is a picture of how you could you know overlay this this maize. Eh? <laughs> uh, maize is maize in Dutch, by the way. Um, 
on different uh, boundaries. So it really cuts through like the national agriculture innovation system, a regional one, a sectoral one, dairy. And yeah, it brings these actors together to complete a mission. Yeah, so for example, for protein transition, it could bring together people from dairy, people from uh, arable farming, and also see how can you get the expertise of the dairy sector in creating products together with uh, those people coming from the plant-based sectors. And you see that happening. You see that lots of dairy companies uh, now already engage with plant-based movements. So it brings together sectors. It also goes across boundaries of countries, basically. You cannot just analyze it at a country level. So what is also quite um, interesting that it's that these mice, they future transformative or mission-oriented innovation policy mixes or bundles. And this is also about uh, advancements in thinking about innovation policy. Uh, so there are three frames. This is work of Johan Schott, who is basically an innovation thinker. He basically says the first frame was more kind of the linear model, um, basically uh, transferring technology. The second frame was about the innovation systems model. Let's uh, create interaction amongst multiple actors, but the main goal is economic uh, growth and uh, economic uh, welfare. The third frame also takes into account kind of these transformative ideas, planetary health, etc. And so not just seeing this as an externality or seeing it as a correcting market failure, but proactively engaging with uh, these sorts of yeah, challenges or these sorts of values. Um, and basically, you can then also see that different policies uh, take place at different uh, stages of this X curve. And so it's not just about promoting innovation uh, through R&D funding, promoting experiments, missions, but it's also about uh, uh, promoting X innovation by, for example, pricing harmful practices. Uh, it's also about giving more preference to who you think has the, the, the food system of the future, and really at some uh, stage also phase out stuff, but also compensating the losers and help them uh, transform perhaps to kind of this new reality. Uh, so there have been quite interesting reports, for example, in Norway, in the UK, about how can we help dairy farmers, how can we help uh, other people who work more in the animal-based sectors, also having a role in this plant-based transition. Uh? and perhaps continuing to produce animals, but in a different way, perhaps with a lower intensity, and at the same time use their skills uh, to support kind of this plant-based protein transition. So what does this perspective uh, can do? Uh, or what are the sort of questions one needs to ask uh, if you talk about mission-oriented innovation systems? Well, you can, for example, look at, at a country, any country, and, and say, well, what are the missions a country have? Does it have a mission, a transformative mission? What is the relative size, importance, attention? Uh, what are the policy mixes? What are the choices country make, make in, in, in terms of where they want to go to? Um, why have they emerged? Is it because uh, you see all kinds of emerging technologies from startups? Huh? Nowadays, we talk a lot about agri-food tech startups. Uh, they see opportunities. They work with kind of a Silicon Valley model they want to disrupt. So does it come from that? Uh, does it come more from a problem analysis in a country? Uh, is it coming from foresight, vision-oriented uh, exercises? And how do different uh, uh, pathways or missions envision and enact sustainability and transformation? Well, I already said who drives them. There I mentioned the, the ACTEC also. But what is the composition of the multi-actor networks? Who's included? Who's excluded in a particular pathway? Uh, is it just innovation, also ex-innovation, and, and where do they play out? So to end with, some quick examples of uh, some missions which are already observable. So like I said, in, in, in the Netherlands, circular agriculture is the paradigm. It has emerged like five years ago. It's kind of the overall concept. The government has left it quite open how to interpret it. So uh, you see more tech-oriented pathways, you see more agriculture-oriented pathways, and perhaps that's also good huh? that, that, that you see yeah, uh, different sorts of new systems emerge which serve different audiences, not a one-size-fits-all model. Um, this is quite well formed. There's lots of innovation going on. Um, however, a risk was, or, or, or a 
uh, downside of, of this new policy approach was that they didn't really reform how they created the policy instruments and how they did the agenda setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yes, of course. Briefly, because our similar time is actually we reached the end, but okay. uh, since it has been really thought provoking and uh, we are all really, uh, so if uh, the colleagues have consensus to, go, to stay longer, we continue. And also um, online colleagues, uh, apologies for going over time, but uh, please uh, feel free to stay longer and uh, be part of the discussion. We have very cute crowd of questions. I'm sure in the room, there are quite a lot of questions that my colleagues would like to ask as well. So I'm just uh, flagging this since uh, we went over time. But, this is uh, your opportunity to run. It's, Do it uh, while you can. I'll keep you here for another half an hour for sure. Uh, as usual, it's always really thought provoking and mesmerizing to hear Lawrence uh, speak. <laughs> well, not true. Okay, thanks, Deji. Um, yeah, I thought I'm going grossly over time, but overall with the whole session, we are a bit going grossly over time, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so basically the design of the whole policy approach made that kind of incumbents were still very much leading as yeah, so existing powerful players, the agenda setting, which of course didn't really help in getting new exciting uh, views on circular agriculture on the table. So uh, they built it on an old policy structure and yeah, this, this, this legacy policy, this, this legacy instrument hindered actually uh, inviting newcomers to really open and broaden uh, uh, the perspectives. And so if you want to do like a MICE approach, you also should scrutinize your policy setup and really see, you know, is there some policy we should phase out? Then looking at the Chilean agri-food system, um, the country where I currently live and work, um, there you also see like this transformative thinking coming up much more strongly. Also, Mariana Matsukato two years ago had a big tour of Latin America. She also came to Chile. She was seen as the ideologist of the Boric, the left eco-socialist government, um, uh, which also had implications for the policy, which I will talk about later on. Uh, but basically also here you see this kind of thinking coming up. So what you see is that while more transformative oriented programs had already started a couple of years ago, and the interesting thing is that they had survived different government changes, which previously didn't happen a lot because new governments tended to destroy all the policies from previous governments. But the good thing is you now see more continuity. Um, in the latest government, they have made it much more explicit, huh? transformation. Uh, they even have an office for a just an ecological transformation with the Ministry of Environmental Affairs. Um, they also have realized this is not, not a thing just one ministry can do. So if you look at the agri-food sector, uh, you see that there's more inter-ministry coordination with uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Ministry of Health, etc. But what you see here, as opposed to the Netherlands, they don't have a guiding concept. They basically uh, put a lot of problems there or a lot of broad solution directions, but they don't give people something to really hold on to. Eh? That is also a bit of a, a balance. Eh? How strong do you direct or how much do you leave it open? So here you see descarbonisation justa, eh? just decarbonisation, resiliencia a la crisis climática, resilience to the, the climate crisis, uh, diversificación productiva sostenible, yeah, productive, sustainable diversification, all very nice, but also very, very open. And so this directionality, very broad, and still it's, it's quite short-term focus. They don't produce outlooks for 2050 or something. Um, what you see is also that they don't really uh, reform their policies. They merely take a new pro an old program and put a new source on top of it, like uh, uh, the Programa the Desarrollo Productivo Sostenible, it was called the Programa Desarrollo uh, Productivo, so they added sustainable to it. Huh? So they didn't really reform their, their policy mix. Um, and it's more 
based on supporting new initiatives and less on phase out. But you do see some signs of proto institutions it's getting established. Huh? You have, for example, TT Green Foods, which is a sustainability oriented program. You have Chile Crea Futuro, which does some outlook work. Uh, but you can do outlook, but you also need to bring it back to the present. You have the Estrategia de Sustentabilidad Agroalimentaria. So there is some strategy work, but it remains quite open. Then New Zealand, a country where I also have worked quite a lot. Well, New Zealand actually was one of the first to at least do mission-oriented science. They had the national science challenges. But more recently, I've also started a more kind of thought exercise to think about, you know, what should we do as a very export-oriented country with all the problems which highly export-oriented countries have, that their agriculture has too big a footprint for the country, basically. So you can already see it at these reports. It's about reframing. It's about also well and Z, about different values. So it's, it's, it's getting there. So basically, we did a little study on this, and we saw several initiatives that work on different transition pathways towards agri-food systems transformation. Basically, there's work going on on protein transition. There is work going on on circularity, agroecology, etc. You also see new networks of actors, also sometimes beyond the usual suspects, the Crown Research Institute, like Plant and Food, Ag Research, etc. What is it? Fonterra, the big players, but also non-traditional players. So ag tech startups coming at the table, food systems dialogue were organized also in New Zealand, brought a lot of new papers to the table, and also incorporating the indigenous visions and Maori visions of transform agri-food systems. I must say this was with the previous government. The new government now has, again, a new stance towards, for example, more science. So that also has implications. So we do see some, some traits of an emerging mission-oriented AIS, but still uh, uh, a lot of fragmentation of programs, also some lock-in still in current systems, legacy policies. This excavation thing is a very difficult thing because it's also highly political. So it's not yet a full mission-oriented AIS is what we conclude. Then the last one, uh, Costa Rica, the almost last one. Uh, it's also known as a front runner in sustainability in Central America, at least with energy transition, uh, being carbon neutral. And now it's also slowly starting to engage with ideas on agri-food systems transformation. Well, FAO, together with Wageningen, did a report on what are uh, caminos hacia sistemas alimentarios, uh, pathways. And with a PhD, we did some work uh, focusing on agri uh, climate smart agriculture. And what we also noticed in the analysis, and this is basically what is in orange, the rest is eligible, but just focus on the orange stuff. This is a time life of policies. And you see that the more transformative outlook of policies and the instruments they use, it's, in it's increasing over time. So at least transformation is much more present in the discourse. It's also being translated back to new instruments, but there again, because the old instruments keep on existing, it becomes a huge pandemonium of policies where also the transformative yeah, um, ambition gets lost in translation. And so it's, it becomes quite incoherent. So this again means new policies good, but also get rid of uh, some old policies and policy instruments. Then the last case, uh, German agri-food systems well, uh, mission orientation is highly pushed by Fraunhofer Institute because there's a lot of people like Jakob Edler working there who really are think thought leaders uh, on this. So they've also done uh, some, some exercises, uh, future food systems, food for thought, etc. cetera. Um, there's a permanent Senate uh, commission in the Senate on the transformation. So you see it's, you know, there's stuff going on. The actors are there. Uh, uh, the agri-food tech people are there. Uh, there is a coalition for agroecology. Um, people have also uh, from from uh, Fraunhofer and from the Umwelt Bundesamt have done studies where are the niche players, uh, the, the new upcoming food system players, so what are the regime actors, as they call it in science language, uh, the people, the incumbents uh, who uh, want to maintain perhaps the status quo or perhaps are also changing. So there's many actors working on it. Uh, there's thinking uh, on transformative policies. Um, so also here, uh, you see such a mission-oriented approach uh, becoming yeah, uh, more uh, 
predominant, but if you look at mission-oriented innovation system Germany, you won't find anything. So sometimes it's also a little bit implicit. So the conclusion, um, different countries have this, this mice in different stages of development, and in some countries it's stronger in terms of thinking, in terms of practice. You, you might also say perhaps a mice exists alongside another AIS. Yeah? So perhaps it's the more transformation oriented branch and perhaps you should also keep the two systems alongside. Perhaps you should continue to improve incrementally in the most sustainable way possible while you work on the next generation solutions. Yeah? Uh, but in some countries, yeah, this, this more transformation oriented branch is smaller and in other countries it's more bigger, more prominent. Um, this perspective can help what, where, and how agri-food systems transformation are supported or not, and by whom. Um, for example, this sort of perspective was used in the EU and they looked at uh, the policy mix for transformation and basically draw the, drew the same conclusions. It's still incoherent. There's lots of legacy instruments which actually hinder. Well, also in the European Union, you, you, should, you, you could see sort of a um, counter-revolution of all kinds of vested interests eh, with the farm to fork and the green deal. Basically in the lobby chambers, it was all reduced to something very minimal. Eh? Um, so there were good intentions there. There was the thinking there, there was an intention to put it in practice, but then it was also reduced. So you also really need to look at, at the power. Um, FAO also has done work on this eh, uh, with, with the different scenarios uh, for, for agri-food systems, innovation systems. But I would also say, uh, and I, I, I say this uh, clearly and loudly, uh, it's an emerging perspective and it needs further strengthening. Eh? You could also say, yeah, isn't this just uh, old wine and new bottles? Eh? Uh, it's the same innovation system with like some transformation talk around it, but nothing different. Eh? Also in the old days, innovation systems had visions and missions. Eh? What's then different about it? Well, I would also like to hear from you what you think about that. Well, if you want to dig into some of the, the science work, here are some, some references you can look at, um, uh, including the New Zealand study, also the Costa Rica study, um, also a study on agri-food tech as drivers of this. I thank you for your attention, but I need to click on because the most important slide comes as the last one. You need to connect with us, with them. Connect with them. They want you to connect. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Lawrence, for, again, very thought-provoking presentation. And also, I thank uh, all the colleagues in the room, as well as uh, those on, online still clapping their virtual hands. I see a lot yeah, of that's yellow nice. hands. I even uh, see them here. That's oh, yeah. good. So that's very nice uh, as did. well. And uh, so um, without further ado, uh, let me open the floor to questions and the comments and reflections. and. Uh, yeah, Courtney. Hello? Yeah. Hello, I'm Courtney Price. Working... Hi there, nice to meet you. I'm Courtney Price working in the Office of Innovation. Thank you so much for your presentation. My question is about where the missions come from. Mm -hmm. You talked about in the, earlier in your presentation how states are really, you know, yeah, kind yeah, of a yeah. main driver. So maybe you understanding a little bit how these missions emerge and, and formulate as, and also where you see uh, let's say non-state actors attempting to promote certain missions and mm -hmm. how that's going yeah 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 so in oh that's also possible whatever you like let's take a yeah. couple more questions yeah. uh, and then we can uh, if okay. there is alexandro and uh, Silverajo. okay go 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 ahead go ahead i was closer yeah Hi, Lars. Hey, <laughs> no need to introduce. We know each other. Yeah. Uh, how you do you have any metrics for assessment mm -hmm. if the country is mature enough, ready to do the mission? Because I mean, you give a nice case studies from the Dutch, Germany, but then I'm thinking in the countries where we are working in the global south, how if they are really ready to adopt to uh, to mature. I mean, also from the digital point of view, we have the same issue. So, do you have any or working on such kind of metrics? It will be good to to give us like insights. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, my name is Silvaraja Ramasamy. I work here in FAO. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of points. One is you mentioned about the green revolution, you know, from, from the developing country perspective, especially from the South Asia perspective, uh, green revolution is not a bad thing, you know. It lifted millions of mm -hmm. uh, farmers, millions of people out of poverty and food insecurity. Uh, and of course, there were some consequences, but uh, if you do a trade-off analysis, it uh, had a more positive impact than the negative. And of course, the negative impact is being addressed very systematically, which is not a big issue, except some pockets. The other thing is um, on the mission orientation, uh, you know, if you look at the smallholder farmers, the objective function is profit maximization mm -hmm. or productivity enhancement. And automatically, when my objective function is pro profit maximization or productivity enhancement in intensive systems, like uh, growing three crops in a year in a tropical region, automatically you need to depend on external inputs. And that tells you the, the pathway of the transformation. You know, whatever we talk about, uh, Circularity and uh, sustainable systems, agroecology, regenerative agriculture, zero budget natural farming, organic farming, everything that boils down to putting something from outside. You need more input because the nutrient mining in the intensive systems is huge. And without additional input from external sources, you cannot really maximize the profit mm -hmm. or increase the object, you know, uh, productivity. In Africa, for example, the free trade agreement, one of the main aim is to productivity enhancement. You know, the crops having 500 kilograms per hectare or even less in a marginal, most vulnerable areas, you need some input. And there, if you focus more on the agroecological type of uh, approaches, of course, you know, I'm not against the ag agroecological type of approaches, which is very good and a sustainability point of view. But at the same time, it shouldn't be kind of a counterproductive and not serving the purpose to these farmers to earn some little income. And for smallholders, it's the, it's not, the farming is not a rec recreational activity. It is a survival, you know. So we, have, we will have to really balance it, how the mission can be uh, balancing rather than orienting towards a particular dimension mm -hmm. which may not serve the purpose to the smallholder farmers. That's my point. Okay. Well, maybe a round of answers. My memory space is also limited, so, so you want to yeah. Go? So as regards the, the, the first question, I do think that some countries uh, already formulate some clear concepts, which they see as guiding. Uh, not necessarily one concept. Uh, in the Netherlands, it was very strong, but sometimes they do uh, frame a couple of concepts. Um, and then it yeah, is a more a, uh, explicitly formulated mission. And sometimes they also engage with the mission language and discourse. Um, this is particularly true in OECD countries. Uh, because the OECD has really pushed this approach. Uh, um, uh, and yeah, that also makes that it becomes more uh, explicit in policy discourse. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't have like mission oriented uh, practice and policy in other countries, but sometimes they just don't use the term. Like Chile, uh, they're very onto Matsukato, but because it's seen as the ideologist of the left wing government to prevent. Uh, resistance from the right wing in parliament, they don't use the term mission oriented. They call it challenge oriented or transformative. Um, but Chile, for example, has it less clearly formulated what are their missions, but they do have this idea we need, really need to change our productive systems. They won't uh, uh, do the way uh, they have performed uh, in the last 20, 25 years. We're seeing too many negative impacts. Um, but it doesn't exclusively exclusively come from states, but then it's it's also not framed as a mission. But for example, you have think, think tanks like Thought for Food, um, which is like a global movement, which is very much uh, into promoting youth and agri-food tech. 
So they see agri-food tech as the way to go also to bring in youth, et cetera. Well, you could also see that it, sort of as an organization pushing a global mission for transformation. If you look at their, their documents, you will also see a lot of this missions thinking uh, in it. So I do see it as, yeah, as, as a sort of philosophy which, which comes from different places. You know, even some companies, uh, they also use the language of transformation. Uh, some are accused of greenwashing, huh? but I do think there's also some really good intentions and, 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 and well meant practices there. And you could also see that as sort of mission oriented thinking, but how it connects to each other, uh, how it becomes synergetic, that is something to be seen. I don't have the answer to it. Huh? Um, and it also links to Nicola's question. I, I do think that um, we haven't yet at least I haven't yet developed a, uh, a package of indicators to measure how these um, mission-oriented innovation systems um, advance. I, I don't think you can do it with classic indicators like R&D input and output, etc. But I think you will need to look at indicators such as um, societal sentiment analysis, discourses, um, you might need to look, for example, with alternative foods, you know, in media, how much they circulate, but also uh, you would need to analyze Crunchbase. How many startups do you see emerging, surviving, who go to scale up, the, the, the level of investment? Um, so you would need to look for, yeah, uh, perhaps beyond some of the conventional indicators uh, to measure it. Um, but I don't yet have a set of indicators. I'm also not very much an indicator person, but it definitely <laughs> needs to be done. Yeah. Um, and I think ATIO is also an organization or a an, an effort, an initiative. Uh, it might become an organization in the future, who knows? Uh, um, we need to do foresight here, um, uh, which 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 is working on this, um, this, this novel sorts of indicators. Um, as regards the last question, um, I think transformation is different for, for every country. It also depends on the challenges a country has, um, the problem it needs to solve, and, and, and it can follow different pathways. Um, you mentioned, for example, that some um, countries need external inputs, but then I think it's also the task of the country to see how can we formulate like uh, a sector development uh, plan that incorporates high external input uh, agriculture or plantations which don't produce uh, too many externalities. Uh, perhaps say, see how can we replace chemical inputs by biologicals and engage with the whole development biological scene. Uh, but perhaps also say, you know, which sort of farmer in a country, FAO has done really great work on uh, also future, future farmers, the EU has done that, USAID has done that, also among smallholders, who would be the sort of farmer which could go with that system? Uh, who could be the sort of farmer who is happy with an agricology system? Huh? Uh, because there are some farmers who also choose for that, but I agree very much not see it as exclusive, but see it as uh, parallel pathways, basically. But I think as a country, you should get clear what is it what we want to do for the future and how can we also accommodate the diversity we have uh, in our countries. Uh, I think in many countries you now see a fairly well-developed agroecology um, uh, farmer community. You also see p people who want to adopt some agroecology principles but not as hardcore like regenerative agriculture or organic systems. And you might also say, well, perhaps we need another sort of system if we want to maintain export agriculture, which is more based on external inputs, but then let's see how can we make those more sustainable. So have a couple of parallel pathways in a country. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry, I have another meeting, but uh, I will be quick. And um, I, I really find um, you very smartly uh, asked us the question how uh, mission-oriented uh, AI uh, 
AIS differ from AIS? Uh, I was going to ask you the, that question before, but so what I can uh, what I can observe is that um, while AIS would uh, not have a distinctive leader, the leader can change, right? So in in mission oriented agriculture innovation system so far, there is somebody uh, a stakeholder group that yeah. uh, uh, takes the lead and. Then uh, this is very interesting. Whose uh, mission AIS stakeholders implement, mm -hmm. uh, and we should really uh, be clear when we um, uh, provide mechanisms to strengthen mission-oriented mm -hmm. agriculture innovation systems. So to make sure that it's not only the governmental mm -hmm. uh, yeah. policymakers' mm -hmm. vision. But it's uh, it's a shared vision. Uh, very often, also nowadays, governments are not strong. They do not really have uh, the political will and the time uh, in the democracy framework to take over and implement the mission. And but there are there is a social a societal need to be implemented. So. The question is, uh, how do you see the multilateral governance in AIS uh, working or not? Thank you. Yeah. Shall I? Yes, you, you shall. have some room. Yeah. <laughs> no, I will build on that and just complement, yeah. uh, not to make your task uh, too, too difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a long journey, I think, uh, on this AIS thinking and practice. Mm -hmm. um, you, you are going through since many years and myself uh, as well. I feel that, uh, so it's a dialogue, all the thinking on AIS is really a dialogue between uh, 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 theories and practice about how this mm -hmm. happens concretely in the field. I feel that my mission oriented is, is more about capturing things that do happen in countries in terms of, yes, yeah, some countries did um, uh, set some missions, especially agroecological mission in the mm -hmm. field of uh, okay, and uh, and uh, and and it has been set in a very many in many cases in democratic ways, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to civil society. And uh, so I fully uh, agree with the question of Nevena. The next step is to think about what are the, the mechanism to 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 support that. And in particular, my question was and. Uh, uh, about uh, the fact that in all this thinking about AIS and in particular mission-oriented innovation system, we lack uh, the managerial perspective uh, to support the transformation of uh, innovation systems on the one hand and agri-food systems on the other hand. I was in Senegal past week. With, I discussed a lot with uh, all the stakeholders of the agroecological transition. Mm -hmm. And they clearly said we need to support the government to move from a phase to another because agroecological transition will go step by step, phase by phase, and the government has no clue on how to organize these phases, uh, how to, to manage one phase and to decide when they are ready to move to another phase. So for me, mission-oriented innovation systems is very much about uh, these managerial uh, approaches. Uh, that is still a big gap in academic literature, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of guidance, practice, uh, uh, to make it much more operational with models of action. And in, in this model of actions, we need to bring all the knowledge about uh, behavioral sh sciences, like how people at some stage change their minds, etc. So um, I would say, yeah, in, in all this uh, new landscape of uh, mm -hmm. mice, how do you mm -hmm. foresee uh, the roles that uh, research should play mm -hmm. to fill these types of gaps, and which is urgent gaps, I think. Uh, and we don't have so many work in this area at the moment. And these types of academic work should be much more engaged, uh, closer, you know, to practitioners of people like what's doing at FAO mm -hmm. uh, to, to implement, uh, to support, let's say, uh, mission-oriented innovation systems. So talking from your institutional mm -hmm. position and perspective, mm -hmm. how you can contribute to action mm -hmm. uh, in the countries done by uh, practitioners yeah. and FAO mm -hmm. in particular.
have them stored. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, please. <laughs> Yes, I'll, uh, I like also to put two points on the table and hopefully I won't complexify too much. But I'd like to start with a light note uh, uh, from a French poet who wrote the following in a book called uh, Les Cendres Vivantes, The Living Ashes. Plus j'avance, plus l'ombre s'accroît. Je serai bientôt cerné par ces monuments détruits et ces statues abattues. The more I move forward, the more the shadow increases. I will soon be surrounded but it's destroyed monuments and by its rundown statues. Translation is mine. Mm -hmm. What I want to get to, the two points. One, we have a huge inertia, you talk legacy, of the old paradigms, right? So my question is, um, and I'll be very specific from an investment point of view, um, in order to transform, to accelerate the change from one paradigm to another, right? Mm -hmm. To not be surrounded by too many dead statues, and, and corpses and legacies, uh, does performance count? Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, do you think, from your experience, what you're seeing around of paradigm shifts that you referred to, does measurement of performance, according to different criteria, of course, and indicators, is a key factor for government to say, OK, let's move to another paradigm? That's question number one. Uh, question number two, since you're a teacher, Professor, a key element of the transformation is the unlearning, right? You talked about this word, which I learned today, which I'm certainly going to use, ex novation. Beautiful. So we need to de learn. Mm -hmm. Now, from a teacher perspective, from a, from a professor perspective, mm -hmm. are we moving into that direction? Is the learning of these concepts or other playing an important part or should it play a more important part? Should this also be an area tackled by Atio in the logic of uh, Akis, you know, the old notion that, you know, education is always the poor yeah. child of research extension and, uh, and you get in the triangle. So what, you, what about that? Thanks. Yeah. That's it? Okay, one more. I'll be very quick and less poetic. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, because you didn't really mention it in your presentation, as far as I could see, the concept of true cost accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, you you hinted at it, um, and you mentioned yeah. Uh, yeah, different yeah. models that are needed. What do you see uh, as, what could be the role of true cost accounting in, in, the, in the transformation that is needed? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, online, we still have some people online. Uh, surprisingly, I'm very impressed uh, by uh, their interest in staying with us. If you have any questions, please post them right now. And uh, then uh, this is the uh, last round of questions. Yeah. OK, well, very good. And uh, also uh, thought provoking questions and tough questions. Um, so as regards the first question, uh, clearly, this basically adds a new, yeah, how could you, could you say it, a new boundary to AIS thinking. Eh? We, we used to look at AIS at the country level, at a sector level, at a technology level. Eh? And now we look at something which is driven by a challenge, which incorporates <laughs> typically multiple countries, multiple technologies, multiple sectors, and also sometimes plays out in multiple regions eh, where you have hotspots of development. You clearly see that, for example, with alternative protein, that you have some hotspots of development. So I think a mission-oriented innovation system, eh, it's indeed yeah, a collection of people who experiment, who want to do things differently, who are also, yeah, I didn't talk about this whole thinking about innovation niches, who are sort of a global niche of an alternative system to uh, um, uh, dominant systems. And that does require international learning, international interactions. And I think there, uh, multilateral contexts are very important, but in what form? Uh, you could say, for example, that, that multilateral 
uh, interaction is, is, for example, very important in terms of leveling the playing field or, or, or for, for establishing new standards uh, for, for example, new, new products, which is very normal for any innovation. But for example, there you now see in multiple countries a lobby against alternative protein in terms of that they can't use words like milk or anything which is closely related to dominant animal production sectors. Yeah, and perhaps there you need a more multilateral perspective on how do we go about this. Um, yeah, that's an example I can mention. You could also say if you want to do phase out, you would also need to think multilaterally about what is the new balance you want with different systems because existing systems are not all bad and do not all need to disappear. Uh, but perhaps uh, uh, you need yeah, multilateral agreements on that. And I think those things are probably also discussed at at COPs and all kinds of fora internationally. Then the practice perspective. Um, well, I think that, you know, most of the instruments we have for um, the old school AIS, which also doesn't disappear, are also still valid for more mission oriented work. So you can have sort of innovation platforms or, innovation alliances or learning alliances, uh, but you organize them with those that perhaps are connected to existing systems, but also are capable of breaking out of them, that it doesn't become sucked back and becomes nothing in the end, eh? which is also a risk of innovation platforms. They become talk platforms and nothing much happens. Uh, so, so you do need to create, I think, more of these spaces for experimentation to really push the boundaries a bit of systems. But there you would also need to yet yeah, in some way liaise it back to government to get them on board. Um, I do know, know some examples of yeah, more transformation oriented programs, which have very been very successful in pushing a certain concept and really, you know, being thought provoking and creating that space is, is quite important. And then eventually it trickles down and then the masses follow. Um, that perhaps doesn't go as fast as, as those that take are taking the steps in the field would want. But I think, yeah, that's the reality that sometimes changes go slow and with, with small steps. Um, but I do think um, that in terms of a practice perspective, yeah, we'll need to see, you know, do we need to do things differently? Do we need new toolboxes or can we do it with existing toolboxes? Um, I think for some of the diagnostic work, I think the, the, the current, you know, tools will work, but perhaps in terms of a long-term portfolio perspective, you need to link into like new work by the CGR on innovation portfolio management. You need to work more on scaling readiness or uh, the systemic scaling perspectives. I think that is an important one, which also includes, for example, instruments such as behavior change. Um, I don't think we do that enough. And, and that also uh, goes, goes towards other segments, which we typically do not consider like uh, uh, consumers, big processors, big retailers, etc. Uh, I think that that is perhaps where you can do more change uh, in terms of behavior uh, that doesn't just sit with farmers. Um, yeah, and I think that also connects a little bit um, to, the, to the dead statues. Um, um, or do I miss a one? Um, that's the one? Yeah, um, and inertia and that kind of stuff. Um, oh. Who said the one about unlearning? That was you, yeah. No, then I'm skipping one. Yeah. Oh, you had, to, oh, you had two questions, I think. Um, measurement. You also had the question about measurement. Yeah, you had two questions. There was it. Performance. Um, I think, of course, you know, measurement uh, counts. You need to show um, that an approach makes sense, that you do see perhaps more breakthroughs or scaling advancing more rapidly because you put more effort in it. Um, I think that's very important. Um, I think we, 
we are as yet still gathering the evidence on the mission approach. Um, I think in the current stage, it's still as a policy approach, very much in the experimental phase. I think even if you would go to the OECD uh, mission oriented innovation policy dashboard, uh, you, you will only find emerging experience, uh, sharing about early experiments, uh, about early experience. And I think we, we need to get a more so solid measurement of does this pay off if you really kind of prioritize, uh, focus on a couple of missions or whether it doesn't make any sense to do that. Um, um, so I do think performance counts, definitely. Um, I do also think that that perhaps that this also has to do with legacy, um, that we should not only perhaps zoom in on the efforts of the public sector, but also uh, mission-led private sector action. To what extent is that unfolding? To what extent is that really kind of making previous systems obsolete because it offers such an attractive value proposition? And many, many countries, you see huge ag tech and food tech systems developing, they have some have public sector investment, but they're largely led by private sector. We also need to monitor to what extent are they really making the change because perhaps they're more impactful than uh, the government stated uh, goals. Or perhaps sometimes you see they reinforce each other. But I find this a really difficult question and I couldn't give like a clear answer as you, uh, as you noted. Um, in terms of unlearning, um, Definitely unlearning is important. It's about unlearning practices, about unlearning technologies. Eh? This is also a little bit this ex-novation. Um, and perhaps it's, it, it, yeah, it should um, get more attention that you just not only promote a new practice, but also pay much more attention to yeah, the unlearning aspect of it eh? um, and to what extent that, that plays an important role. Um, and I do think that in terms of the students we are forming, that in some parts of the world, this is taking root. I have the advantage I can compare between two universities. If I look at Wageningen, there's quite some attention to this. There's lots of attention to decolonization, protein transition, also a lot of student-led movement. The students come for this, they want this, they demand this, they're the new generation. It's sort of in their DNA that these sorts of concerns. If I look at my Chilean university, they're old school agronomists. And you see most of the Chilean agriculture universities are now recently thinking about these new challenges. So there is still a way to go not only in terms of teaching more systemic perspectives, also more the food systems perspective. It's all very much field agronomy towards export crops. It's about sustainability, but about sustainability within current paradigms. Agroecology, you don't see it lot, a lot, at, at least not formally, not at my university, perhaps in Santiago, in the capital where you have a bit more alternative students, you do see it. But there I do see a challenge and I think it won't, will not be the only LMIC where you see these challenges. But perhaps there's also pockets in LMIC where you will see that unlearning has already taken place a lot because I think there are some universities in LMIC which are hotspots, for example, for agroecology. So you could also take that good experience and try to see how can we kind of scale that in a country. Yeah, um, and the last question, the real, the true cost accounting. Well, I think now true cost accounting is very much used for looking at current food systems and what is the, the larger footprint or the larger cost in terms of health, in terms of uh, all kinds of other uh, externalities, which should be inter internalized. I think true cost accounting is very much important for the alternatives. Are they as good as they say? What is their true cost? Do they ha really have a true cost benefit? Uh, I don't think we do that. Uh, enough. I think we look mainly at current system, but I think we should also do it for alternatives to also, uh, if you look at measurement of performance, provide the evidence, they are something to really bet on if you are pursuing these goals. So I think this is an important direction to do more work on, if it hasn't been done already, but I haven't seen it. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Good questions. It will keep me going for a couple of years working on this. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Let's end here. I, I, I was obviously the worst moderator of a webinar today, but I had hard time cutting since uh, this is so relevant to to our discussions and what we are doing with the mainstream project, etc. And uh, the 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 relevance of the seminar uh, is uh, the fact that uh, Vincent, our director, who arrived from uh, Zimbabwe this morning at 4 a.m., uh, he basically sat there over time till the end, uh, which uh, shows how uh, yeah. relevant and important this discussion was. And I I uh, thank again for everyone for staying put and being interested. And uh, most of all, Lawrence, thank you so much for. This is a very interesting discussion and uh, really thought provoking uh, questions that posed throughout yeah, your yeah. presentation. And uh, with that, uh, everybody, you know how to find Lawrence or us, and uh, we can continue discussing this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, people on Zoom.